Hey everyone, welcome back to Life on a Mission. Uh, my name is George. I am here with a special guest today. Uh, he was a Bible teacher for me in high school. I learned Old Testament from him and uh, now he lives and works in the West End. He's had a huge influence on me. His name is Joey Eaton. Uh, Joey, thank you for being on today. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tell me a little bit about yourself and just introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I pastor a church in the West End of Louisville, in the mm -hmm. Portland neighborhood, and I've been doing that for eight years. We went in initially to to revitalize the church. Mm -hmm. It was in, in bad shape and didn't have a lot of things going on, so we initially went to to revitalize the church and if, if, turn the corner yep. and kind of see it as like a revita plant now. We've kind of nice. killed it off. Not really, but yeah. yeah, and now we've kind of replanted the church and, and tried to breathe stability back into the church. So cool. Yeah. And uh, and you're at uh, Southern Seminary right now. I graduated there from there in 2008. Okay. So yeah, I've been gone for a long time. Okay. What did you study there? I did um, an, a Master of Divinity in Theological Studies. Okay. So cool. So where are you from originally, and what would you say brought you to kind of where you are now? Because, I mean, when I first met you, you know, you were my Bible teacher at a private yep. Christian school on the east end of Louisville, mm -hmm. and now you're operating in the west end. Good, yeah, good question. Um, I came to Louisville originally to go to the school, sem mm -hmm. seminary. Quickly, once I got to seminary, I did not enjoy as much living on campus and and just and wanted to be be where the people are, I guess you could say it for a lack of a better term. And uh, so we, a couple of my friends and I, found a house that we could rent in the West End. Okay. Um, we, I, was, I was at the time attending a church in, a, in, a, in someone's house that lived out in the West End, so that was my first oh, interaction wow. with the West End. So... We got a house and we actually let about seven or eight homeless people live with, live with us off and on for like six months. Wow. Um, Did you have a family at the time? No, I didn't have a family at the time. Okay. Um, we didn't really know what we were doing, actually. We just thought it was a good idea. Yeah. And that house burnt down, which is an interesting story. While you uh, While rented we were it? There. Yep. Yeah. While we rented it. So then we, we moved closer to campus for a while. And then I got married in 2008, and then quickly we decided that we'd move back out to the West End. What uh, yeah. what caused the house to burn down? Somebody set the house next door on fire. So it was arson. So arson of another house, and it caused your house to burn down. Yep. Wow. So when you got married in 2008, um, you were living back on campus at the time, but then you felt drawn to go back out to the West End. Yes, absolutely. Um, when did you start in that timeline? When did you start teaching at the private school that I went to? So I graduated from seminary in, in May 16th okay. of 2008 and got married May 15th, the day before my oh, wow. graduation. And then uh, shortly after we got, I got married, found out about the job opening at the school mm -hmm. and applied and got it. Got, it, got, the, got an interview and got it. Supposedly okay. they had hired somebody already and then they decided that they would hire me. It was good. Wow. So you were having a lot of interaction with the West End at the time. Um, you knew that that was kind of where you were drawn to, but yet you were operating somewhere in the East End. Um, for anybody that listens, um, I definitely come from that community that's in the East End. Um, I'm from a, what you would call maybe a, a, a bubbled or sheltered community. Um, just from your experience of operating on both ends of town, what would you say that you would see on a daily basis that, that maybe you enjoyed or maybe disliked or just things that you just noticed were just all around different? About the experience of going back and forth or just in the West End? Or I guess just maybe like... I don't know. I did a service project down there um, in the West End one time with Barry Washington. Mm -hmm. And uh, me and a lot of my buddies on the basketball team, we went down there and we served food. And 
well, we had Thanksgiving down there, and it was like, to us, it was just like an eye-opening experience of like, you know, how how different um, how different life like life can be just on like a thirty-minute drive from the other side yeah. of town. But from somebody who experiences that on a daily basis, you obviously knew a lot more about that. Yeah. Um, was there anything that like? Hmm, I don't know, I'm kind of having trouble filtering out this question, but... I think I know what you're, you're, you're trying to get to. We... I did notice... Um, disparity and stuff between mm -hmm. the two cultures. Not necessarily... One, was, one wasn't necessarily better or worse. Yeah. Just different. Different yeah. struggles in poor communities mm -hmm. and different struggles in rich right. and well-off communities. Um, you know, so in the West End, everybody is just outward with their sin. It just yeah. doesn't matter to them. Like, yeah. the green light is on. There's drugs at this house. Like, yeah, there's there's prostitutes walking the streets and um, fights breaking out in front of my house and mm -hmm. gunshots three times a week. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's it's way easier to see the problems mm -hmm. and the issues. In in the East End, the problems and issues are there. Hmm. They're just masked often. They're, you know, people go oh, in. Like and, nobody wants to acknowledge. Yeah, people go in and shut their garage doors, and everything happens in the house. And mm -hmm. there's greed, and there's complacency, and there's uh, you know other things that are are masked with. Well, these people are obviously doing better in their life because look at the houses and the cars they drive. And these people are obviously doing worse in their life because look at the cars and the houses they drive. Right. And, you know, we, we view often wrongly people from a fleshly perspective. Yeah. And the, the Bible's clear that we don't view the people in that way anymore. Yeah. And so, anyway, I, I did, I, it was interesting jumping back and forth between having to wrestle with different uh, manifestations of sin. Did it, if that makes any sense. Did one or the other ever bother you more? They all bothered me in yeah. different ways. Because they all, yeah, I was, I would wrestle with my own frustrations and sin, mm -hmm. not just in response to those two places, but also the things that I was dealing with. But yeah, they're, it's frustrating that people litter all over the place in the West End and don't care about their properties and yeah. are neglectful of their children and, and mm -hmm. things like that. And it's frustrating and, you know, it's, it's hard teaching the kind of discipleship that, you, that the Bible teaches in a place like the East End. Right. <laughs> because... People are like, why would I live like that when my parents just gave me a, an SUV and right. I don't have to worry. So, so yeah, both places for me were there were barriers and obstacles yeah. to faithful ministry. But that's that's, that's part of the course. That's normal. Yeah. So. What do you think about um, your life experiences or how you were raised? Like, what would you say from that brought you to where you are now? Yeah, I mean, raised, I was raised to be a good boy. Yep. Like, I wasn't, I didn't, my, my parents are great. They they became believers shortly after they were married, mm -hmm. which, which uh, my parents divorced when I was two. And so when my mom and stepdad were married, I was four, they became believers shortly after that. So they kind of okay. grew up learning the faith and mm -hmm. weren't necessarily, you know, faithful attenders at church or faithful Bible teachers in the home. But I mean, I was raised to be a good boy and to, mm -hmm. I was, I was brought up in with some godly leaders as well. Um, I think, I think the Lord's just kind, was just kind to me to save me and help me to believe and implant some convictions and views of, of life yeah. that were a grace, were a gift, were something that I wouldn't have come up with on my own yeah. if I was still dead in my sins. Like, yeah. When he makes people alive, he gives them eyes and gives them hearts and minds to see and believe and think. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's just part of that sanctification process throughout the years. I, I think I, I, I think your question's good, but you know, we often will put a lot of weight on how we're raised. Yeah as to how we're living today or what views we have today when we're all raised dead 
in our trespasses and sins. Mm-hmm. And he can make he can make a murderer of Christians alive. He can make anybody alive, and regardless of how you're raised. So I was, you know, I was raised. I didn't experience much. Like I, I was definitely I stole things and mm-hmm. was I bullied people at school and got in fights and was addicted to sports. Yeah, you know your typical youth yeah. addicted to pornography. Like Just your typical youth hormones, kind of struggles. Hormonal teenage. Yeah. Yes, and have have felt the Lord um, shepherding me. Yeah, through that. So, so would you say then? You know, people don't have to look at their home life or their past to to close doors to their future like do you so would you say that nobody really kind of has an excuse to operate the way that they do if you know if they want to blame something on their home life yeah i think in in for the sake of being compassionate like our pasts um create in us weaknesses that could that Mm -hmm. need to be worked through like how you're raised or whether you're raised to be a godly person or whether you're raised in a pharisaical home or whether you're raised without any parents and mm-hmm. you live on the streets. Like I think the Lord uses those stories for our good, mm-hmm. but I don't think anybody should look to the past and like see an excuse or a justification for not pursuing holiness or, yeah. or, or uh, anything like that. Yeah. You know, I, um, I definitely say that I was privileged to um, be able to learn under you and uh, Brian Dewey and Dr. Nicholson, Dr. Shoemaker, other people that I had in my life. And um, unfortunately, not a lot of people get that opportunity, um, just like people my age. Yeah. What would you, if you could speak to the audience about um, like what it means to be a Christian, like like what you have learned in your walk and like what you wish other people would have the opportunity to know, what would you, what would you tell anybody? Just like if they had no idea what it was. So I'm speaking to somebody who has no idea what it means to be a Christian at all. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the scriptures tell an amazing story of, of a, a a God who creates and loves and and not a God who's distant or starts some domino process, but he's he's massive and yet close and near and fosters relationship and creates a story of of a world that is is uh, damaged by rebellion and sin and didn't leave it at that. He could have, would have been justified mm-hmm. to, to condemn the whole world. And he, he decided in his grace to, to save and redeem and send a son who was, who was, uh, well, has always existed. He, was, he didn't create the son. He always existed. And, mm-hmm. and the son came and lived a perfect life and really demonstrated what true humanity is, what it means to be human. Um, you know, we say that we sin. I, I, I mess up with lust because I'm human, and, yeah. and Jesus would say, "No, no, you you mess up with lust because you're you're sinful." Yeah. Here's what true humanity is: true humanity loves and and stands for truth and justify and, and and seeks justice and yeah. And so Jesus demonstrated that fully God, fully man. Uh, died on the cross, perfect for the sins of people, and and yet while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us and gave us his righteousness and absorbed our sin and, and the wrath of God that was deserved and then raised on the third day and and the story didn't end there. He gave the church the Holy Spirit and empowered the church to proclaim this message to the world and to each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the Christian life is a unified, or the Christian story is a unified story of a, a God who redeems, creates, this this created world falls, and and then God works out this story of redemption to to bring back this fallen creature, this yeah. fallen mankind, yeah. through through like incredible acts of providence and yeah. sovereignty throughout the whole Bible. 
And so, and the Christian life is a gift. It's a, it's a gift of this merciful God who creates. And it, it really is a response to the mercy of God. That's it, what, what the Christian life is. If you want power to live the Christian life, it's, it's going to be because you've been overwhelmed by the mercy of God. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's a lot more you can say about that, but yeah. Well, let's say that somebody just heard what you said. And yeah. Found some serious conviction. What would you say to somebody that, you know, they're, they're wanting to embark on a life with that. Yeah. Like they want to have a relationship with God, but they're, they're not sure what direction it's going to take or what to expect. What would you tell somebody who might be about to dive into that? Yeah, I would say connect with a local church that's healthy Mm -hmm. and that preaches the gospel. You can, don't just go to any place that has a Bible in their title, like find a healthy church that preaches the gospel and anybody and any leader in that church would, would take you in Mm -hmm. and shepherd you in that quest to find Christ and to live for him. So I would, I would say that's the first step and, and then they will lead you on to repentance and and um, confessing that that Jesus is Lord and mm-hmm. and then they'll walk you through how to faithfully uh, connect with the church. The Christian life isn't meant was never meant to be lived individualistically. Like it's not about just you and your own personal walk. Like yeah, the the beauty of the Christian life happens in the context of a local church, a faithful. Not perfect, but a faithful local church. Every every letter that we have in the New Testament was written essentially to a church. Yeah. So all the commands that the, that Christians are held to are commands that that are that flourish and that can be can be uh, or most experienced in the context of a, of a body of believers. So. Okay. Yeah. One of my biggest struggles coming up. Um, was I, I was never someone who who wasn't educated about the mm-hmm. Bible until my later years. Like I grew up in a Christian home. I went to church and mm-hmm. I went to a Christian school. Um, there's been a struggle of mine though where I feel like all up until a couple years ago um, I was living a life in pursuit of comfort and I didn't really know that. Like I didn't understand it until I was able to go overseas and you know see the way that other people are living Mm -hmm. but I don't know how to communicate that to people properly without telling them that like you know it doesn't matter if you get a good job like it doesn't matter if you have a nice car or a nice home like your your idea of the American dream like I don't necessarily believe that you should even like go for that if you're a Christian, but I don't know how to say that properly. Right. What would you say to people, um, you know, who want to pursue a Christian life, but maybe have this predisposition of pursuing comfort at the same time, or or even someone like if you spoke to me, who you know you taught me, I went to a Christian school, I had all these tools at my disposal. What would you say? to me or to anybody else who has that tools, what, what you feel that they're called to? Yeah. Um, we, we are all given gifts and desires, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's, there's a misconception often in the, in the Christian evangelical world Mm -hmm. that if you're going to live a faithful life, you have to pursue pastoring, youth pastoring, yeah. or missions. Mm-hmm. And you can't own nice things, and you can't work at nice places. Mm-hmm. And if you do, you're just going to be maligned and looked down upon and guilt-tripped yeah. at every sermon because you have nice things. So I would, I would say that um, we, you know, that's a wrong way of viewing life, I think. Like, yeah. I think if every if every Christian if every Christian decided in the whole world, well, if I'm going to be faithful, I'm going to have to pastor, youth pastor, missionary, go set up water 
clean water in another country, and yeah. every Christian left their doctor jobs, their teaching positions, yeah, um, their theater roles in the theater, like art, the arts. What like everything would deteriorate or become so secular and humanistic, and and then we would have no ability to influence any other field. Like, yeah. So, the the temptation to grow comfortable and mm -hmm. complacent is is real everywhere you are and every and in everything that you do. Mm -hmm. So, our temptation is like to become so extreme. Like, okay, I'm I'm becoming complacent, so I'm just gonna throw my computer out the window and and sell all my cars and get a horse and carriage and and, and then you, you you get you, you're not really solving the problem so yeah I would say my, my encouragement would be to become a, a Bible lover love the Bible mm -hmm. the the Bible is is it's, it's I've been pastoring for eight years and I never thought I would say that the number one problem in people's lives in my church is that they that they don't love the Bible. It's, yeah. it's, I was talking to somebody the other day who was feeling sad and that they, their life didn't have any purpose. And I asked them, when was the last time you read the Bible? And it had been like three months. <laughs> it's like, well, there you, there you go. Yeah. You know, my job as a pastor is done today. Yeah. Um, so like people need to love the Bible and, and, and need to faithfully unite, kind of like rediscover what membership in a local church is, is meant to be. And do you think fellowship and intentionality is kind of a growing problem in the American church? Yeah, yeah, it's a growing problem, and it's it's vital. Like Hebrews, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is all about the mm -hmm. the, the uh, obstacles that we face mm -hmm. to faith, to, to real faith. Yeah, and many of those solutions to the obstacles are meeting together. Yeah. Don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another, one, one another, and all the more as you see the day draw near. So like, there's this growing intensification mm -hmm. and growing centrality of fellowship that iPhones and and video games and just the 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 lack of desire is is like butting up against. Yeah, for sure. With social media and video games being brought up is there a certain way that you operate your household like with your kids and everything involving social media yeah like, well our, my kids are eight six and five mm -hmm. so no, nobody has an account yet yeah um you know the best way that i try to help is to model model it mm -hmm. and you know i try to try to put my phone down whenever i'm with family and yeah um try not to talk about it and make it appear that this is my life with yeah. my kids so hopefully they're grow I mean they're still growing up in a world of you know when people in the church yeah. come over they're bringing their phones and looking at Snapchat and they're curious yeah. so like it's not all bad and not all wrong but but it does and it can be can be a problem for sure yeah but yeah we 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 don't have you know we don't have internet in our house mainly because it's we can I can find so many other things to spend 20 bucks on a month yeah but so we, you know, it's just natural. We don't cable like they watch. But our no kids cable watch, and no internet. No, but our kids watch movies and we have a DVD player. And okay, cool. So we don't like. We we don't want to say all media is bad to our right. kids. But it's not. It's there's a lot of amazing stuff out there. It can be useful. Yeah. yeah. But we don't also we don't want to create a, a, a like a culture in our home of dependency upon it for fun or family time or yeah or yeah things like that. So yeah. I've always kind of wondered to myself, like, I don't know, like, what the right answer is, but it's like, I've always wondered, you know, God willing, if I have a family, like, when am I going to allow my kids to have phones or social media or electrical devices and whatnot, and, um, I don't know, it's just been, that's been, like, something that I've talked about with my friends, and, like, some people are on one end of the spectrum, other people on the um, other end of the spectrum, because, you know, I'll say... I'll say, like, I don't like how it disconnects us, but then somebody would be like, well, what about Stephen Furtick and, you know, his uh, ministry and elevation on, like, how he's got such a massive following on Instagram, and so it's like, yeah, you're right, like, there are, like, 
good ways for it to be used and then mm -hmm. there's like bad ways for it to be used but yeah I'm still looking for that answer myself we need wisdom like it's it's constant um, the scriptures like I, I just preached from Ephesians 5 um, where, where to live is wise not unwise mm -hmm. making the best use of our time because the days are evil so I like, <coughs> that's a very generic phrase for Paul to say yeah. but it's timeless like Mm -hmm. Every age is evil, and every age needs wisdom to navigate through it. Mm -hmm. And so that, like, that's that's the main issue is is people aren't aren't being wise with their life and their their time. And we need we need help in those those ways for sure. Yeah. Well, so going along again with your ministry down at the West End, you've planted a church again. Um, is there anything that any project that you're kind of working on or coming up with or anything like any five year or ten year goals that you have with this church? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we we are a simple church mm. and I don't mean that like lazy. Mm. We we are a church that is in a community that that is worn out yeah. by big program centered ministries. Yeah. So like in our context, um, our you know, our five if we had a five year plan on paper, it would be to grow in maturity, for yeah. sure. Um and, and and have really healthy relationships with people around us in the neighborhood. Co like consistent um gospel friendships and relationships with people around us. Has that been the most difficult part? Of yeah, the yeah, ministry? yeah. So when we, the, the the neighborhood and the people in the neighborhood, I like to say have been spiritually um, confused and abused for yeah. years. Yeah. Like the prosperity gospel is like all over the poor parts of the world. It's just yeah. so easy. You know, you yeah. lie to people about their what what their faith can produce for them. And especially in the area of monetary gain, and yeah. then you have a you have a, boom, a booming organization, you know. Yeah. So yeah, people have been um, poorly shepherded, neglected by other parts of Louisville. Like, it's 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 easy to see why ministries can thrive in suburban parts of the world or right. parts of Louisville because there's money. Right. In the West End, it's not profitable to start a ministry because it's just there's you're not going to have an expensive. Yeah. budget like yeah so it's it's definitely ministry is different it's more it's more organic like I hate to use that word but it's a good word it's it's more every day like taking care of your home meeting people on the streets yeah and and gathering together faithfully nice. you know so like yeah that's kind of what we've been doing for years and then on, on my side of things as a pastor the goal of a pastor is to equip the saints for the right. work of the ministry. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that I've done. We, we have a pastoral discipleship program where we're discipling guys that are thinking about pastoral ministry. Nice. And really the purpose of it is not just to train them for discipleship ministry or for uh, to, not just to disciple them for pastoral ministry, but mm -hmm. I think faithful husbands and businessmen should, yeah. should know what it means to shepherd faithfully. Because <laughs> like, there, yeah, every man and every everybody in the church ought to bear the weight of ministry, and yeah. counseling and shepherding and caring for and bearing burdens. Yeah. So we have that. We also I started a group for guys struggling with sexual sin, and so we yeah. have a, a, a two. We have a weekly meeting um, regarding that, and we have a guy that we just brought on to help with help with our music. And yeah, help us with our services. So like. There, there are, there aren't many like in five years we want to have five thousand people like nothing like that. Yeah. Not, in, not in this part of town. Yeah. Um, Numbers but, isn't the goal. No. Yeah. No. So we, yeah, we we'd love to plant another church mm -hmm. at some point. So we've talked about what it would be like to take twenty of our members and plant yeah. them somewhere else, and maybe the West End or maybe yeah. another, another n desperate part of the world. What's the name of your church, by the it's way? It's called Garfield Avenue Baptist Church. Cool. Yep. Cool. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, 
Um, you said you started a ministry or a Bible study for men struggling with sexual sin. Mm -hmm. When did that come about and kind of what brought that about? Yeah, um, we started that about about uh, six months ago, okay. seven months ago. Gosh, maybe it's been longer. And I was just meeting with several guys individually yeah. who were dealing with this. Mm -hmm. And so I found myself bouncing around, kind of talking about the same things. Yeah. And so I started bringing it up to every one of these guys individually. Hey, I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to do something every week, and we're going to get everybody in the same room. All, all 12 of you. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to just do this together. Cause this, first of all, it's getting crazy for me. Yeah. And I think that everybody, everybody can help each other mm -hmm. fight. And as you're sharing victories and struggles, like I think there can be strength potentially in numbers here. Yeah. So I brought it up to guys that everybody loved it and kind of been meeting ever since I've been sharing my own journey, but also just, we've been going through passages of scripture and encouraging mm -hmm. each other, sharing victories, speaking into like where people are weak. Mm -hmm. just giving counsel to those situations. There's been um, expectation that when you're struggling throughout the week that you call people from the group from the from the group. Yeah. So it's not just your you know we're not just waiting to right. wait. Like there's ongoing conversations and checking checking up. So nice. Yeah, it's been really, really great. I, I think uh, I think it should be part of every church. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I think it should be a requirement for every guy in the church, struggling yeah. or not struggling. I, I, it's starting to surprise me more and more how, um, how much of a curse actual like, not just like sexual immorality, but like pornography, like pornography itself, on like how it invades a lot of homes and everything. I was um, hmm. the last guy that I was talking to about this. You know, he it was a buddy of mine and he was, you know, saying, he's like, I kind of wonder where I would be today if I had never just like, mm. if I had just never clicked to a certain channel, you know, like it was just like a channel that was like, it was an HBO channel when he was a little kid and he was like, I was up late and I just, I didn't know like what was going on. But then like, I just knew like that was like the first time that ever occurred. Mm -hmm. And it was just one of those like, things where it just got hooked into my head so hard I have no like I wonder like if I just never clicked that channel what how I would operate to this right. day but yeah there would be another moment yeah a few days later yeah we're just hardwired yeah to, to, to give in to sin you know so yeah but yeah there those are good questions to ask and think through and the, the great part about life is that you, if you have breath, you have a, a new moment to fight and just experience victory. So nice. whatever you've, whatever horrible perverted things you've done in the past, mm -hmm. even if the past is like 20 minutes ago, yeah, there's a kind, a, there, it's, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Mm -hmm. One of the biblical authors says, so like we, we have, we are able to repent and experience. Yeah. It just takes extreme decisions. Yeah. Yeah, so like, yeah. What have you, um, in the years that you've lived in the West End, like in the years that you came to Louisville, what have you learned about yourself? It's a good question. Um, what have I learned about myself? Um, man, I, I, I think, I think uh, in the years coming to Louisville, you said, like just... Being here. I guess it's, yeah, just like uh, operating in your ministry. Like, so, you know, you grew up, you went to school, and then you got married, and then, you know, your ministry kind of got started at that private school, and then down in the West End. I guess when that started, was there anything, like, that God just, like, showed you about yourself that you didn't really realize coming out of the gate? Because I knew, I knew, like, when I went over to Italy, and I was working with West African refugees, and I was... Like, I was hearing their stories, and then I was, like, reflecting with myself on, like, how could I relate or something like that. There was just a lot that I didn't realize that was mm. going on in my soul that that was shown to me. Like, I had to go halfway around the world to learn this just about myself. Like, mm. I wasn't just going there for them. Like, mm. I was going there for me. 
and it was one of those things where growing up in a in a Christian school and going to a mega church I had a lot of opportunity and a lot of tools to to gain you know and to have and to be able to use but I didn't understand like I still didn't understand my heart at the time and yep. I didn't understand like what to use those for or like how to operate and it was like when I went out there I had like the intention of like throwing down all these um like these verse references and all that and showing people like the cool parts of the scripture but then I didn't realize I was like man you just got to approach these people with love like yeah. you have to approach everybody with love like that's the only way to really reach somebody yeah and it wasn't until I went halfway around the world that I realized that yeah. and I was just like wow like I really had to go out there for that so I think a couple things come to mind one is how in how just this is gonna sound like you didn't know this already, but how incredibly weak I am as a man. Just very weak. I mean you think about in a course of in a course of eight years, married, three children, church revitalization, caring for a family mm -hmm. and and you, you just realize that you're not a hero like you're not a superhero. You can't do everything. I can't shepherd everyone. I can't please everyone. Mm -hmm. I'm just weak, and I'm, I'm completely dependent on, on strength. And you know, growing up, you're you're you kind of got that invincible mentality. I'm, I'm, I'm smart. Everybody's telling me I'm going to do great things. Mm -hmm. um, I can't fail. Like I feel like I'm doing everything right. Everything's going well, and everything's going according to plan. And I'm going. To, I'm just like following the course of everyone else. And yeah. And then you. The Lord quickly re, re gets. He doesn't get glory for any of that. Yeah. Um, and so he he's good at at creating context of weakness. Yeah. Like Paul calls them thorns in the flesh, where. The Lord's like, I'm not taking that away from you. Absolutely not. You know, I, I'm, it's there. Yeah. Some people wonder what Paul's referring yeah. to. Do you have any idea what he was referring no. to? And I'm glad he didn't tell us. Yeah. Because if it was like his eyes were weak or it was a lust problem, it would be like, well, I don't struggle with eyes. And I don't struggle with lust. So yeah. I don't got to worry about a thorn then. I think he leaves it. There's several texts. There's, there's great, uh, Depth in in gen generic when he when he's generic there there's a lot of depth because yeah. you can we can all relate it yeah. can really be anything any weakness we that, can relate with struggling period yeah any weakness that that relates or any weakness that could push you into the sufficient grace of Christ yes yeah. I think the so yeah I think weakness I'm just weak and also another issue that has come up over the years is what uh, what my identity is like what is going to, to cause me and define me, mm -hmm. what I'm going to allow to define me and who I am as a yeah. person. There's, there's like, if, if uh, 20 people come up to me after a Sunday sermon and say, great job, is that going to define me? Like, is that going to make yeah. me a man? Or, if, you know, fill in the blank. Yeah. What men are tempted to define and, and use to, to to give them meaning and purpose and value and worth. So you're curious to kind of look back on like your life and like seeing like what you accomplished and like you're kind of wondering what that would be or like wondering like is is there going to be more than this or is there am I going to be switching up gears like is that what you mean? No, I mean like I I mean so I think you you asked what have I seen in myself over the last eight years? Yeah. Since being a little bit, one of them is just struggling to find what should define me, what okay. should be my identity, or what I'm going to receive strength from and encouragement from. Okay. So, like the more I live, the more I realize how unimpressive my life actually is. Yeah. And how, like no matter what my accomplishments are or no matter how many times my sermon is re-listened to online, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Like th that's, that's not what matters in the grand scheme of gospel life and following Christ. So he, so he you know, he and what, what Jesus has said about me yeah. and what, what he has done for me 
and how he satisfies me is is what defines me, not, not you know, nothing else. Okay. So just wrestling with that in various ways, like struggling with a season of first season of early on in ministry of just complete like sadness, like I'm failing at everything. I don't feel like I'm doing anything, and yeah, nobody seems to be enjoying my shepherding. And yeah. If somebody had a criticism, like going on for a month of despair after that. Yeah. But the reason was deep, like deep rooted issues regarding uh, worth and identity. So what do you tell yourself during those times then? Like, you know, if somebody gets into it, oh, it's just my GoPro, it's over. So what would you tell somebody um, going through like a dry season or like a, uh, like a season of difficulty, like just thinking to himself, like, man, is this really worth it? Or like, what am I, what am I doing here? Like, yeah. what is going to happen? Um, what would you say to encourage somebody? Well, I would, I would, uh, I, I would go back to originally, like, go to the Bible mm -hmm. and go to the Bible often, drink mm -hmm. from it often. The Bible is full of people who are asking the same question. Mm -hmm. Like, you read the Psalms and Gosh, they're they're pretty. They almost sound heretical in some of the psalms. Like, why have you forsaken me? Like, yeah. Why have you forgotten me, God? And like, yeah. people really wrestling with some deep seated issues. Mm -hmm. So, those are the best counselors. People that have gone through it. I mean, reading the Psalms of David and reading what he had to go through. Yeah. Like, it's great to read that and know that okay, I'm in. I can be encouraged. My kids aren't pursuing me to kill me. There isn't, <laughs> yeah. there isn't a whole nation trying to kill me. Yeah. So yeah, I can deal. I can deal with this. And then Jesus, like the reason you go to the Bible is Jesus. It says that he went through everything known to man, everything, and, and came out without sin. He's yeah. the sympathetic high priest. Yes. Hebrews two tells us. And he he's able to through the scriptures really counsel us in yeah. in our difficulties. Yeah. So. What we need is faith in the promises of God yeah. to make it through any hardship. Okay. And we need that in the context of faithful fellowship. Yeah. Most people who struggle, it's because they've neglected the church. And I don't mean like, well, I attend every Sunday. Like some of the most neglectful people of the church are the people that attend, attended every Sunday. Yeah. So it's not just attending and it, it's, it's, it's filling yourself up with the Bible and then really fulfilling Colossians 3. Yeah. What, what Colossians 3 teaches us, singing hymns and songs and spiritual hymns and uh, spiritual songs to one another. Yeah. Like coming to the church filled with encouragement. And yeah. So yeah, I, w I would, it's, it's a journey. Um, it's, it's normal to struggle. It's, it's common to struggle. Mm -hmm. And, it, and we struggle for various reasons. We struggle because there's potentially unrepentant sin in life. Yeah, things that we're dealing with that we're not that we're not dealing with. Yeah, and and I, w I would say there might be a level of repentance that needs to be um, needs to be handled. So yeah, there's several ways to answer that question, but yeah, for sure. Um, what piece of scripture would you say has had the most influence on you, or you draw strength from the most? Oh man, yeah, that's that's a good question. That's like asking what's your favorite breath right. of the yeah. day. You know yeah. what, what breath do you draw from mm -hmm. strength? It's just the next breath that I take. Yeah. There's lots of scripture. Um, I'm preaching through the book of Ephesians right now at the church. Okay. And so, uh, yeah, I've just, I've drawn great strength from Paul's presentation of the gospel in the first three chapters. Yeah. And then his presentation of the gospel life mm -hmm. in, the, in the next three chapters. So it's pretty amazing. Um... Yeah, I, I've I've drawn great strength from from passages all over the Bible. It just depends on what's what's the next one that I'm reading. Yeah, Psalm 34 is a, it's kind of like a go-to passage. Yeah, for me, it's a uh, it's just a beautiful psalm of praise and declaring God's power and His yeah. satisfying love, and that's that's just that's comprehensive in life. If I'm dealing with lust, you need to do. You need to go to that psalm. If I'm yeah. dealing with sadness, that's an incredible psalm. If I'm dealing with pride, that's a great psalm. So, yeah, yeah. There's 
I could go on for for a year for for a long time now talking about all the breaths that have meant yeah. the most to me. Yeah. Was there ever a moment or was there ever a sermon or a scripture that you heard one day that kind of floored you? Can you think mm -hmm. back on one where that was just like it was a big moment for you? A sermon that has floored me. I I was I remember hearing sermons. I don't always necessarily remember the speaker. Mm -hmm. I do I do sometimes. The speaker doesn't always matter. Yeah. But I do remember hearing sermons that would talk about the glory of God. Yeah. At an early age. And those were always the most refreshing sermons to me. Yeah. Like you 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 want to hear sermons or tempted to want to hear sermons about like me and how do I fix this problem and what are the steps that I need to take yeah. to have a better life and and those sermons they're great and they're helpful and they they could be really practical but they're they're kind of empty as well. Yeah. So I remember growing up hearing hearing sermons about the glory of God, a sermon on on how he, how wise he is or yeah. massive or things that he's created. And at the end of the sermon it's like, oh man, I feel more equipped yeah. than ever to deal with this issue or mm -hmm. things like that. So I, I remember in high school hearing a couple sermons on the glory of God and those were more monumental moments for me. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Um, switching gears, talking about um, you and your wife. I... Um, have met a lot of Christian couples who have dove into a life of ministry together. I um, got to observe uh, a couple out in Italy that hosted us. Um, what do you think? What do you and mm, I'll just give you a broad question. What is your life like with you and your wife mm -hmm. as a couple in ministry? Yeah, um, I deeply respect my wife. Mm -hmm. She is, uh, she's great, man. She um, is is a faithful, godly, and um, amazing woman to marry. She mm -hmm. She's really the reason that we're up in the West End. Mm -hmm. When we first went to the church, I was kind of like, eh, this is going to be hard. It's kind of quirky. Yeah. We went. We went the first Sunday, and there was a karaoke machine leading the worship service. So like it was just bizarre. And it smelled old. And it was just gross. And I was like, "This is my yeah. first." I, I said in the car, "I was like, yeah, there's no way we're doing this." And she was like, "No, we have to do this. This is great. This is a great opportunity. There are old people here. We can love on the old people. Nice. There's this is a great neighbor." So she, you know, she's she was the one that was. I was thinking that, you know, she wouldn't enjoy it so much, but. Yeah, she's she's great. She's um, innovative, creative. Mm -hmm. She uh, is a great mom. She we homeschool our children, um, and she just does a really great job with 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 that idea. And um, she's not afraid to live in scary neighborhoods, which mm -hmm. I, I think is really attractive. <laughs> nice. Uh, and she's yeah, she's great. She cares for me and supports me and. We're very different. I'm more. I'm more of an emotional, mm -hmm. deep feeler kind of person, and my wife's a little more logical and to the point. And your your right brain, she's left uh, brain, big time, big yeah. time. So so it works well. But uh, yeah, we we show a lot of hospitality. We we have people live with us all the time, and she doesn't get stressed out about any of that. Cool. You know, and they're, it's not absurd to have a load of laundry sitting on the side while we have people over. So she's not to consume with appearance and yeah yeah so she's she's great I think she's definitely I'm making her sound like she's never sinned before but she's you know she's uh, she struggles and mm -hmm. gets overwhelmed for sure and yeah. deals with stress and anxiety and things like that and would probably admit similarly that we are weak people and mm -hmm. there's so much to do yeah and as, as you get older and get families there's it just life fills up mm-hmm but I feel like she does a really good job at being insufficient, <laughs> nice. honestly. What, did, uh, what would you say you and your wife have to deal with as a couple in ministry as opposed to any other couples in the world? I don't think it's different, honestly, than any other couples in the world. I think whenever you 
minister to be other people together. Mm -hmm. You just you create, you know, you create a bond, and you also share burdens and mm -hmm. things like that. So, yeah, I think we we often share similar burdens together for people in the church or people outside the church. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think. I think uh, those are. I think that anybody who's engaged in ministry will, will experience similar things. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think I think our struggles are with how to raise children and be, yeah. be faithful to that, and how to. Cause it's, it's, there's not. I think Michelle does a good job. She's a pastor's wife, mm -hmm. so she does a good job of not feeling like that's a position in the church and being normal yeah but she also feels the weight of caring for women in the church and so she does a really good job at pressing into women and nice. trying to be provide opportunities for women women to be discipled and things like that but yeah she and we i think we we are we struggle there are challenges there are things we work through and my my marriage is is definitely not a problem yeah at this point in ministry which is a blessing honestly yeah. it takes a lot of work and a lot of time a lot of conversation, but but yeah. If you were able to, well, how many years have you been married? Ten years. Ten years. We just celebrated ten years. Nice, congratulations. Yeah, man. Uh, if you could speak to yourself ten years ago about your marriage and about your wife, what would you say to yourself? Oh, if I could speak to myself ten years ago. Um, don't worry about having to know it all. You'll just learn it. Like, yeah. don't worry about feeling unprepared. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you'll be fine. It'll be great. The Lord will teach as you need to know things. Yeah. You don't have to know what 10 years down the road is going to be like. Yeah. Just to enjoy the journey and experience experience intimacy and, and serve other people together. And I would probably try to relieve him of any stress that he would have of any temptation to have it all figured out yeah yeah does that make sense yeah no absolutely um i feel like that you know that pretty much relates with you know my generation and all the other generations i think um our generation is plagued with anxiety when it comes to relationships as far as like doing the right thing or what's going to work or what do i need to look for or what can they do for me or what can i do for them and it's mm. all it's all robbing the 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 true nature of like what marriage should be but um as a man that's been married yeah. for 10 years is there anything that you would want this generation to know about love and god and marriage and having all that bundled up in a yeah something beautiful yeah i mean it's nitty-gritty marriage is not it's, it wouldn't make a good film you know it wouldn't be a romantic Mm -hmm. movie that you would enjoy too much Re regular marriage right um, so not like the notebook then oh no something like that no it's not <laughs> definitely not that um it's better than that it's, yeah it's always better than that so yeah um the more that you and the more that your love can can be like jesus's love the better marriage your marriage will be the less that your love is like jesus's love the more disappointed and heartache will be honestly like a lot of people come into marriage they think of sex and they're like it's all about performance and mm -hmm. what i can get out of it and, and things like that and yeah if you think that way you're gonna you're gonna be hurting other people yeah and your marriage will make it honestly mm -hmm. so sa sacrifice i heard what somebody say once that marriage is a is a crucifixion and it sounds it sounds bad but yeah but it's not. It's good. It's right. Like when you when you marry, you die to yourself. Yeah. And you you raise up to serve other people as much as you possibly can. So. Wow. Well, yeah, that's. You know, I I think um, especially me, like for myself, I I struggle with always thinking about the future and, um, you know, just experiencing the amount of disconnect that I have had like um growing up and everything like my parents got divorced i grew up in a broken home but i've also just i've also just had relationships you know begin and end 
and just as a 24 year old right now I I sometimes struggle with not even knowing like what to do mm -hmm. um, like it's like at this point like I hear so many different people in the church or out of the church talking about you know what you should look for how you should go about it and you know some things will just directly contradict mm. what the other person says someone tells me to watch an Andy Stanley sermon someone tells me to watch a, a, a Matt Reagan sermon someone tells me to look up this in the Bible and, I'm, and I'm, it like it just throws me so hard that like at the point where I'm just like listen I, I, I would love to be able to participate in something like this but I don't even I don't know where to begin mm -hmm. and what to look for and like what did like how to even make that like the love that Jesus had for us mm -hmm. like it's for someone you know who feels like that I guess I'm not really looking for somebody but it's like what would you say like to keep your heart open for like mm -hmm. for somebody like me yeah it's a good question it's all about in what you are setting up as the object of your pursuit like mm -hmm. I mean if you're living faithfully and sacrifice is is just a part of the routine for you mm -hmm. it's not gonna be a giant leap to give yourself to someone else so like yeah the more selfish habits that you build now mm -hmm. the harder it will be to love someone selflessly yeah I mean so do things that break break that selfishness in the world in your life and and, yeah. and try now to live live selflessly for others the more i think i think it's living selflessly is has to be a built habit it's a gift to live selflessly it's mm -hmm. paul prays the, for the church to be rooted and grounded in the love of christ we'll pray that you would be rooted and grounded in the love of christ yeah it won't happen if you're not praying for it and so, yeah, I, th I think uh, I think that's a good question. I think I think that's where I would begin for sure. So it's if you if you have that desire to to find connection and find a relationship with someone else, it starts with you working on yourself and kind of just chiseling yourself into that person that you want to be. Yes, yeah, and maybe maybe to phrase it instead of working on yourself, it's it's submitting yourself. To the Lord's yeah. um, sanctifying power, and 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 you'll never be able to chisel away yourself. Like right. the Lord refines and helps, and so submitting yourself to a, a church, yeah, and being in faithful faithful fellowship and and serving serving in capacities that that stretch your comfort in the area of self selfishness and yeah. Um, and I feel like I feel like some of the issues I deal with with people in our church, it it boils down to they're just selfish people. Like mm -hmm. They care about themselves and what they're doing at nights and their free time and and that that just like really really paralyzes and chokeholds the church. Yeah. When you have people that live that way. Yeah. So. Yeah, I would I would encourage you to plead with the Lord. Lord, help me to be and to love like Jesus does in all areas of my life. Nice. Yeah. All right, well, last question and last topic, since we're kind of talking about disconnecting the church. What differences do you see in the church today um, as opposed to the church, the first church in Acts? That's definitely a broad question, but like right when the church began, you know, they talked about like how everyone kind of had everything in common. Um, I guess, yeah. What would you say are the positives and negatives of the church today that you see, and maybe you would, you know, encourage you know everyone to kind of keep their eyes open for to try to. Yeah, it's it's tempting to look at the church at Acts and think, well, they were perfect; they had it all together. Mm -hmm. But you realize quickly that Paul's writing to those churches, yeah, and and in those letters they're dealing with some sick stuff, like yeah. in many ways. So the early church had problems too, mm -hmm. and 
you know, right after, I mean, think about this. I, I hate the fact that people go to camps and come back from camp and they're like three weeks after camps they are like, this is great. I'm a Christian. Everybody needs to know about Jesus. Yeah. And three weeks later, the, the camp high wears down. I mean, you, yeah. can, you can look at Acts and think similar, like, whoa, did you see the place shake? Yeah. The spirit poured out and everything's great and we're suffering for the gospel. And then, you know, like time wears out. I, there, there are definitely some amazing things going on in the book of Acts. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful that those aren't just camp highs, but those were, it was spiritual, spirit-filled new believers yeah. making radical impact in the world and still we're still benefiting from that. So I'm not saying that they they were they were not. They they were just they struggled too. Yeah. So when you look to when you look at the book of Acts and then you look at our context, it, that's a helpful thing to do. I think you just have to be careful too. Yeah. Cuz we you know, we're dealing with lots of things that they they weren't dealing with. Yeah. They were dealing with lots of things that we aren't dealing with potentially. Yeah. But um yeah, I would say that uh I would say honestly, this, this could rub some people the wrong way. The mega church model mm -hmm. um, lends itself to straying away yeah. from some of the benefits of the early church, which many of those early many of the early church, you know, they would meet in homes, and mm -hmm. it was more family centered in churches today. We we like to divide people up to age groups, and yeah. It's the, the early church children were sitting at the table with, with their with their grandparents and yeah they were that's what, I love the book of Titus the book of Titus gives this picture of older women training younger women and yeah and older men training younger men and so you have everybody together training each other and yeah. equipping each other in lots of churches you have the senior adults meeting with the senior adults and you have youth being led by youth. Or being youth meeting with youth being led by somebody who hasn't really experienced much of life yet, right? And they're just like only five or ten years older, right? And it's just lopsided. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think, uh, yeah, the the mega church model, the produ production model has has really zapped a little bit of the depth and maturity mm -hmm. that the early church potentially had. Um. Yeah, and and uh, just. The way of life, you know, it seemed it seems that the way of life was was filled with generosity and yeah. kindness and excitement, zeal. Yeah, like I think I think we we could grow in that area too. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up, but I want to give you the opportunity for anybody that you know that listens to this and you know says, "Hey, I want to go support Joey's church." Um, how can they reach you? How could they come and support? What's the best way that people can help out your ministry? Yeah, um, we we meet at um, 2833 Garfield Avenue in the West End mm -hmm. and would love, the, the greatest help that people can offer is, is if, you're, if, if people are interested in reaching a poor community, yeah. come live and lock arms with us yeah, and, and be faithful members and pursue their neighbors and things like that. Okay. Um, obviously that, uh, that can't be everybody, but yeah, that's the main, the best way to support. Um, yeah. You know, and we, you know, we would love, uh, prayer and people, people praying for our ministry. We, we, we have a website with sermons. You can listen to us. What is the website? It's GarfieldAvenueChurch.com. Cool. So, yeah, those are some ways that, that you could support us. All right, cool. Um, last couple questions. I kind of do rapid-fire questions. Yeah. What's your favorite book? Oh, my goodness. Besides the Bible. My favorite <laughs> book. Oh, that is just a tough rapid-fire question. <laughs> you I, top three. I just, I like Desiring God by John Piper. Okay. I like... Um, yeah, I, I like reading biographies too. So I think if you if you want to grow and as a believer, you, that's those are that's a great place to start. Is just read about faithful other faithful believers. Yeah. Um, you read George Mueller's biography. Yeah, all those are just yeah excellent excellent stuff. Um, 
I mean, I, if you if you branch out a, a little bit, I've I've, o- I've always liked the Lord of the Rings trilogy and things like that. So, <laughs> I knew you were so say just that. things like that. I, I don't <laughs> I don't necessarily read a ton of books like that, but that's just good stuff. Yeah. So, what's your favorite movie then? Favorite movie? Can't say Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question too. There's so many good ones. Um, I like a good story. I like I like it when they're true stories. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I can answer that. Well, yeah, I, I, there's a lot of them that I've liked. Um, I like Shawshank Redemption. That was a great movie. Nice, one of my faves. Um, yeah, I'll just stop. Stay there. Okay, cool. Um, what is the best piece of advice that you've ever received from someone? Best piece of advice I've ever received from someone. Long time ago, I don't know if it was the best, mm-hmm. but I, I think it's. It comes up a lot. Yeah. And he said, you, Joey, are profoundly affected by the Bible. And he's like, I can tell when you're away from it, and I can tell when you've been in it. He's like, just know that. I was like, okay. So, you know, I think think that I've seen that play out, and I think that's probably true for everyone. Just, you like, always keep that in mind. Yeah, just, I'm profoundly affected by it. Okay, cool. I like that. Which is, it's probably not the most, like, earth-shattering counsel that I've ever gotten, but... That's a great, that's a great way to, like, kind of keep, keep an eye on yourself. Yeah, yeah, you know? absolutely. But, uh, well, yeah, so what's your favorite music and or song? Mm. So I don't know a lot of songs. It's mm-hmm. I'm, I'm kind of weird musically. I like, I like classical music. I like... A good, a good folk, folky song, instrumental stuff. I like, yeah. I, like, I like that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know. I don't think I have a favorite song, honestly. Okay. I like to listen to um, movie soundtracks, yeah. things like that. Yeah, I love cool. that kind of stuff. Nice. Uh, if you could travel anywhere in the world, where would you go? New Zealand. New Zealand. Yeah, I saw some pictures of it recently, and somebody took a. Somebody took a tour going from different farm to different farm, and they yeah. could live at the farm for like three months and learn some things and go to another farm. And that's cool. It's just some of the pictures. I just like I want to do that. So nice. yeah, New Zealand, I would probably love to go there. Cool. Um, now, if you could give the audience a piece of advice, you know, anybody that's listening, what is something that you would want people to know? Um. Yeah, I would say. I think one of the one of the greatest, the one of the greatest things you'll ever do in life is is your faithful commitment to the local church, mm-hmm. and thrive thrive in that commitment to the local church. I just I see it. I see people living, trying to live separated from faithful fellowship with other believers, and it's just so destructive. Yeah. Um, so. Um, yeah, find a church that's preaching the gospel mm-hmm. and lock arms with them. Okay. And suffer with them. So, yeah. Cool. All right, everyone. Well, this is Life on a Mission with my good buddy, Joe Eaton. Uh, thank you all for listening. And uh, I will post information below on how you can support him and uh, how you can pray for him. And uh, thank you for being on, Joey. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me, man.